Uh, I'm joined today by Richard Carter, who's the Head of Assurance at Alan Gray. Hi, Richard. Welcome to EVNet Stream. Hi, it's great to be with you. Lovely. Um, I came across Richard's name um, in a brief around the industry and uh, and what it will look like after the fabled two-pot system lands, um, which as we're recording is going to be in a couple of days, but as this posts uh, will probably be distant memory. Um, and Richard has kindly agreed to talk to us around his views around the um, challenges and opportunities in the South African uh, retirement fund context. So Richard, welcome. Uh, do you have any um, initial and starting comments to make? Um, yeah, well, it's it's great to be here. Just uh, some, some thoughts. I think it's going to take a while to digest uh, Tupot and the changes. Um, so even though, you know, there's a, there's a start date i think it's going to be some some time before funds have sorted out all of the administrative aspects i think some will be quicker than others but that'll take a little while um and i think it's going to be a while till the dust settles in terms of um members and their understanding um of this whole thing so i don't think it's um you know i don't think the the launch date as it were um is is the end of the story it's gonna it's gonna take a while to to settle down that's for sure right probably the beginning of the story um and and that's and that's what i'm keen to discuss with you today um is what that story looks like after two pot um and so your views on an industry um that is fundamentally different um from the first of september what what does it look like and where are the opportunities um, so, I mean, a, a few differences. I think we're going to have to get our heads around um, what will initially be, um, you know, quite an increase in small balances being being preserved. Um, so if, if, if the churn rate doesn't change in terms of uh, people leaving jobs, um, then they're going to start leaving jobs with small amounts in, in their retirement pot. Um, and we're all used to, um, you know, 80% of people taking everything um, mm. and, and not preserving anything. Now you're going to have forced preservation of, of the two thirds part. And it's going to take a while before those numbers are big. So I think at first, you know, you might even, I don't know if you will, but you might hear administrators uh, squealing about the, the cost and complexity because they're going to be more accounts for them to, to administer on a paid up basis that are no longer going to have contributions going into them, but are going to be quite, quite small. Obviously, as people, as, as two part becomes you know, a true distant memory. So when we are many years down the line, then those start to become much more meaningful pots, right? The retirement pot, which you can no longer clear out, that's been built with contributions over 10, 20 years, et cetera, starts to be, that starts to become quite interesting. Um, and of course, the ultimate aim of the of the sort of inventors, if you like, I don't know if that's the word of two pot, is, is that people are going to get to retirement on average with bigger balances, right? A better replacement ratios. It's going to take a very long time for that to actually happen. Um, and and so we should have larger balances in time. But I think in the early years that there's going to be a lot of people with, um, especially if that doesn't follow, if they leave, you know, paid up um, accounts with their previous pension funds, um, then you really could have a proliferation of, of small accounts. That's That's one thing that I don't think people are thinking about. I think there is going to be dissatisfaction with the admin fee. That's going to be one thing that's going to, that we're going to have to, to deal with. I mean, an admin fee of whatever it is, different administrators, different numbers, whatever, but let's just say 400, 500 Rand um, on a relatively small withdrawal. That's a big number. Um, it could be more than the tax, depending on the size of the withdrawal. Mm -hmm. That's not, not going to, not going to be popular. Um, there's going to be, right. uh, pushback. I think those administrators that are not charging an admin fee, um, you know, might want to rethink um, and and might actually feel like they have to put one in. So that's also going to be uh, an issue. So I don't think the admin fees will, will go away very, very quickly. Um, yeah, who knows what the tax and the penalties and all of that, how that will go down. I think certainly some, you know, some unions have a lot to say, but I can't see I can't see SARS, SARS changing its stance, mm -hmm. Treasury changing stance. They need the money. Um, and if they if they allow two-pot withdrawals without effectively marginal tax, um, it creates a big hole for them. So I don't think they're going to mm -hmm. roll over, but it doesn't mean it will be quiet. Um, mm -hmm. 
And then I'm still expecting some noise on the whole retrenchment side of things. Right. Um, which I, I mean, I think it would it would it would really damage the system quite severely if you allow full access to the retirement pot on retrenchment. Uh, two pot was meant to sort of improve that balance of preservation versus mm. access. Um, and if if retrenchment just becomes a um, a, a door. Uh, by which you can go back in and read everything again, mm. um, then uh, y the whole point of two-pot goes, goes out the window, really. Um, mm. And in the early years, arguably, it shouldn't be needed, right? Because um, if you have savings in your vested account, that's completely accessible on retrenchment at the moment. And it's going to take some time before the savings in the retirement pot are actually meaningful um, and would make a difference. Um, but I really think that could be a bit of a battleground, um, and it's very important that we don't lose that one. Um, otherwise, otherwise, two part just becomes a negative, right? We have seeding, we pay right. out. You have RAs where there was no access before, and now you pay out, yeah. um, and you still get uh, the full amount leaking on um, retrenchments, and retrenchments suddenly become a whole lot more popular. So right. that would be like a really bad, bad outcome. Um, yeah, you've, you've I actually, answered your question, but there, there we go. There's no, I mean, you've, you've, you've sketched a scene of an, of an administration industry that's highly complex. Um, and, uh, and, and that's never good for fees. Um, and so, yeah, well, uh, there, there are some, there are some pluses. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm expecting and and believe that there's, you know, been quite a lot of push into digitization. And so things that weren't automated before being automated. Um, right. and, and I think that depends on, you know, the administrator's platform. So for example, you know, we, we, we're coming from the background of a retail business where a lot of the stuff's automated anyway. So a lot of the investment for us is, is customizing and changing things that are already done in an online fashion. But if you were doing, you know, if you're just a normal Section 13B administrator, you probably do all payouts manually to date because they are infrequent and they once, they happen once. They're not a recurring once. thing. So, you know, I'm not, I, I, I can't speak for other administrators, but um, you can imagine. But once you put in the effort to be able to pay out a withdrawal digitally and as straight through as possible, subject to all the verification checks and whatever, then... Mm -hmm. You know, potentially it doesn't matter how no, it does matter, but it doesn't matter how many withdrawals you pay out because it should be scalable or more scalable than it was when everything was manual. Um, so a push towards more automation and doing things more sort of in a modern way, um, a push to members interacting online. You're right. There's no branch you can go to to get your two pot withdrawal, there's going to be a website and a form and there's going to be, you know, verification and validation done online. And these things could modernize the practices that, and I'm not saying no one's modern, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. And um, that can go the, of course that takes capital, right? It takes an investment. You've got to put the money into those systems and processes. You've got to refine them. Um, mm. It doesn't come for free, um, but it, could counteract some of the cost fears um, and complexity fears of the, you know, of the administrators. Mm, I am. Um, I'm so glad you've raised that um, around the fees, and and I kind of have a picture in my mind of this highly complex admin environment. But then, the for me, the net winner of two pot is the digitization and the automa automation of of processes. Um, and so, there's still a part of me that's debating, you know fees being levied for processes that should become more intelligent in a fairly quickly turnaround, mm. um, plus assets that are still being held. Um, but uh, I think that's a conversation for another day. Well, just the one thing to bear in mind with fees is, I mean, it's not, it won't be costless, right? So um, putting in place the infrastructure to to manage the pot separately, to make the payouts, to process the payments, to deal with SARS, 
um, to get the tax rights, to do all these things. It's not free, whatever it costs, and we can argue about how much it should cost, but it takes a capital investment and then it takes ongoing cost. If you make it free to the member, effectively you're just cost subsidizing from those members who are not withdrawing. Um, and of course, if you make it too high, well, then you could arguably subsidize your ongoing admin fee. I mean, in, in the extreme scenario, you could cover all your admin from two pot fees um, and, <laughs> uh, and, and the people who take money out every year pay for all the funds admin. I mean, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but that could be the extreme, right? Somewhere in the middle is, is a right balance um, mm. that needs to be struck. But you would think that if it is a material cost, that doing it for free, because nothing's for free, doing it for free really means that the rest of the members are, and especially if they are asset-based fees, mm. are cost subsidizing um, the members that are that are withdrawing every single year. Um, so as I say, I, I don't think, you know, we're still trying to get this thing in. Um, um, so I don't, I don't so think I, this conversation is over, but I, you know, in terms of your question about future conversations, I think there's still, uh, you know, another lap to go on fees. I'm, I'm, I'm so um, chuffed to be talking to somebody like yourself at a house like yours um, around the impact of two pot on retail funds. Um, so, so now we're talking preservation funds, mm, RAs, mm. etc. Um, so I think a lot of time has been spent and in energy invested on your occupational funds and umbrella funds sure. and all of that, but not really in the retail space. Um, what is your view around the ongoing sustainability of retail funds like RAs and PRES funds um, after two parts effectively makes you park your money somewhere? Sure. That's a, that's a tricky, tricky question. <laughs> I mean, the, you can paint a good scenario. You could say, well, you know, the RAs have always had this weakness that there's just no way to get your money. Access. Um, and, and sometimes access is needed. And when somebody has, you know, saved a material, material amount in an RA because that made sense and then circumstances change, life happens and they desperately need money, they're out of work, they have no income and there's all of this money and you tell them, well, don't worry, when you're 55, you can get all this money, but not before. It, it, it's like, it's slim comfort. Um, and so I think this does address a weakness, um, but of course it does depend how it gets used and what the customer behavior ends up being, you know, many are, we, we hope that many RAs are in the hands of people who are trying to do decent planning um, and maybe won't all rush um, just to take the withdrawal wherever they can. Um, mm -hmm. And so if it gets used sensibly, and that, that's a big if, um, you know, it could be, it, it could be a very good thing. You could have a little bit of access, makes the product a more suitable product, could increase the amount of money being invested into RAs. The providers could then win um, and and advisors could be, you know, more happy with the with this product in their, in their tool set because, you know, now at least you're not worried about locking up money because, you know, if you put, so for example, if someone is planning, and I'm not saying anyone should be planning, but if someone was planning to just use that one third as a savings account and access it whenever they need it, if they increase their contributions by 50%, right, um, they would be putting into the two thirds pot what they were putting in in total, right? So they're no mm. worse off in their retirement provision. Um, right. And they've got a tax advantaged um, emergency fund effectively. Um, which then if they don't need, it's all there at retirement. All there. Right. So that's a way that an RA, of course, it's the, you know, the, the cap hasn't been increased for 10 years or, or more. And so for your high mm. net worth clients, mm. they might say, oh, that doesn't work for me. But, but for, you know, an ordinary person saving for retirement, um, may, maybe that's a strategy. Of course, you know, each individual's situation is different. So I'm not giving advice, you know that. Um, but it, it, could make RAs more interesting. I say could, because we have to see um, if everyone is just hitting out and taking the maximum the whole way, then then your point is right. It makes the the product less attractive from a provider's pers uh, perspective because they're doing all the work they were doing before. The balances are lower, therefore the return on on the on the investment to the provider is worse. Um, mm -hmm. so, so so we'll have to see. It does depend how they're getting used. Pres funds is interesting because pres funds mostly people can take a withdrawal, 
right? Um, right. And so you've you've got prayers. You've got if you look at the back book, you've got a whole lot of prayers funds where a withdrawal has been taken, and that money is tied up. And now there's a second bite at the cherry. Um, and I would expect a fairly high level of withdrawals on that mm. money just because you know it's money that people haven't been able to access and the moment you haven't been able to access we don't know what the pent-up demand is but mm. on those press funds where clients haven't taken a withdrawal yet at all you know one would hope that that's a conscious choice they could take it at any time they've chosen not to um plus right. the plus the tax on a withdrawal is going to be worse than the tax on a on a sort of a the other kind of withdrawal, whatever you call that, that you can take from your press fund already. Um, so for that book, I would say, well, hopefully, you know, we won't see um, a, a, a big run on the bank. We won't see people, you know, queuing up to get their um, their savings pot out because yeah, they could have done it anyway. They've chosen not to. Um, and maybe they've got, you know, a sensible plan and they, and they don't need to touch the money. But uh, all mm -hmm. of these things does depend on, on what, what people actually do you know i mean as you said this is going to go out after the first you know what you hear horror stories of the of the thousands of people that are all going to be queuing up in the first week i i don't know if that's going to materialize well hopefully not um and uh, and hopefully the digitization of claims will will take care of that and and sars the system won't fall over um, yeah but I, you'll I, know I, that answer I was um, <laughs> talking about a virtual queue rather than a physical queue. Um, in terms of the money flowing out, whether it's digital or in or you know in person, doesn't doesn't change still anything, money. right? It's yeah. still it's yeah. Um, so so Alan Gray as a as a retail house, um, obviously worked through a number of financial advisors. Do you do you see the financial advice model changing because of two pot? Um, as you were talking about the RA implications, I hadn't even thought about. Uh, bumping up my contributions and using the you know the yeah. kind of savings pot as a as, as a almost a tax free savings account now, um, yeah. so so where does tax free savings accounts go, um, and uh, and and what you know what do you foresee the mm. advice model changing into over the next yeah. period? Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure I have the foresight to answer the second part of the question, but I think many advisors are thinking about this and discussing this and and talking about, you know, how, is this going to change how they would use RAs? Um, uh, I don't think it's, um, you know, I, I certainly think they're ahead of me in terms of thinking about it, um, but in terms of how it will settle and whether it will change um, sort of what, you know, the, what the menu looks like, what an advisor would choose to do, I, I, it's a bit, it's a bit early to to say. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and I, and I do think it is for certain types of clients um, that it, that it would, would uh, make more sense. As I said, you know, if, if, you know, those, those caps that we all thought were incredibly high um, of the right. amount you could contribute, you know, they haven't moved in ten years. So in real terms, they've more than halved. And you know, if they don't move again for the next ten years, you know. You, could suddenly find it affecting more of your client book um and and so that and so that would start to come into play especially if you're recommending people put in 50 percent more well, then that cap becomes more material um tax-free you know limits have hardly gone up and so i think tax-free is um you know it's too small for many for many clients mm -hmm. i mean so many adv not all advisors but many advisors will say sure i use that i put the but i mean really um it, that's not a meaningful part of retirement planning. Um, it's it's just too it's just too small, and it hasn't kept up with inflation. Um, um, so, you know, are they going to are they going to change an approach to that? I don't I don't know. Um, yeah, but who who know, who knows? Um, well, that's an interesting story as it unfolds. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up our conversation with a question that perhaps you can lend some of your insight mm. into and that is what do you believe trustees of retirement funds could do to improve retirement outcomes so the law has <laughs> done something um yeah. what could trustees and management committees and really the decision makers do to kind of bump that six percent sure. up somehow wow that's a great question um i, I am actually a trustee so um <laughs> so that's a very pertinent a very pertinent question i mean i think there's some basic ingredients and it will be different for different funds different circumstances um, but if you think if you think of it it's it's how much people are contributing i do sometimes see you know employer groups with contribution rates that just 
they're just way too low. It doesn't matter if you put get everything else right. If you're starting off by putting in, you know, two percent of salary, <laughs> what does it matter? You know, above risk benefits, mm -hmm. of course. Like, mm, it's sure. that's it's just it's never gonna it's that's never gonna be enough. No, it doesn't matter what. So so and the trustees can't always influence that, but that would be you know one ingredient ingredient you know other are, are people saving enough um and then how can you influence the other ingredients which is you know are the funds being invested well are the default sensor sensible i think that's something that uh trustees do have a role to play in making sure that there are good uh defaults with good investment returns and reasonable fees i mean trustees have a hand to play if the defaults in a fund is inappropriate if the fees are too high that's eating into members uh, benefits and outcomes. So, you know, trustees absolutely have to play a role there. Um, and then while you can't decide what your member does, you can influence the communication to members, the education and communication so that, you know, because um, the, the it's a little bit rigged. People are far more, sorry, that's the wrong word, but people are far <laughs> more concerned just because we're humans with the here and now. Um, and so, this whole thing is a trade-off of, especially when you're still a bit younger, of something very far in the future right. being traded off with very pressing needs, right? And I don't think that, uh, and, and I'm not pointing fingers, but I don't think humans are very well wired to um, to understand these trade-offs and to make them. Um, and it becomes evident in hindsight. Um, and so, like, really thinking about the education, thinking about the communication, um, thinking about how we can try and influence members to make better choices. I think it's, it's, it's time well spent. Um, and I mean, some funds are doing a great job, but I, I but I think that that's, that's the, the a place where trustees should, should want to be sure that you're giving members the best chance of making a good call. Mm, so, yeah. So to summarize, really try and bump up contributions and then manage costs and investment returns, um, you know, as is the philosophy of the defined contribution fund. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, and the retail funds. Do you do you see the advisor um, kind of skill base changing with two-pot now where, where institutional advisors need to start thinking more like retail advisor than the other way around? Um. I'm I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I guess it depends exactly what role the um, providers providers playing. I mean, I think the advice to the fund and to the board of trustees, you know, it's I don't know that this will necessarily change the nature of that. Um, but I do think that, um, as I said, you know, members need better communication, and whether that's coming from you know some uh, an advisor that's been appointed by the fund or whether it's it's helping the HR department have, um, you know, better um, uh, information, better tools, you know, a better helpline. I, I'm not sure what the solution is, but somehow we have to make sure that um, because the the dangerous message uh, would be that one that says one that goes something along the lines of, oh, you you know, now going forward, a third of your um, contributions will be available. There's this pot of money when you need it. This is how you get it. You know, focus all on the process and how to withdraw and whatever, whatever. And then, you know, an understanding builds up that, you know, that one third of the money is meant for meant savings needs. and short term needs. And then everybody will do it. And then if you're not doing it and all your colleagues are paying for their holidays and bumping up and paying for school education and topping up this and topping up that and you're not doing it and then they're like well what the money's there why don't you just take it you know so the, that the, i'm not saying that's the narrative but let's say that was the narrative how do you how do you compete with that how do you put an alternative picture um on the on the table um and how do you so if you're not in the going to be sitting down and having a one-on-one -on -one with every employee which obviously is 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 not always feasible and possible um how do you make sure that that information and that other narrative is 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 being spread. I think an advisor has a has a part to play, and that's the million dollar question: <laughs> is uh, is the education and the literacy around um, around this uh, this monster that is looming? Um, Richard, thank you very much for your time. A very insightful conversation, um, and I look forward to possibly a follow up after the event, and uh, we can carry on our conversation. Thank you yeah, very I'm much sure for joining us.
I'm sure you'll be able to point out all the things we didn't quite get right, but let's see how it goes. And thank you very much for today. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.